Welcome to Media in the Mix, the only podcast produced and hosted by the School of Communication at American University. Join us as we create a safe space to explore topics and communication at the intersection of social justice, tech, innovation, and pop culture. Welcome back to Media in the Mix. I'm your host, Grace Ibrahim, and today I'm joined by Irina Gilbertson, an SOC alum, and you did public comm and poli sci, correct? I uh, graduated from American, both SOC and SPA, with dual degrees in public communication and political science, and I also participated in the leadership certificate program um, at the university, which was another really excellent program, and I did it all in three years. <laughs> Can you just give us a little bit of an intro to, you know, where you're at now in your career and your life, you know, where are you situated, all of that jazz? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am currently at Amazon uh, overseeing strategic campaign development for brand and promotional initiatives for Ring, the home security brand, um, in addition to creative marketing operations. Um, <clears throat> and it's been a bit of a journey. I started my career um, in the advertising realm as an account manager and spent quite a bit of time um, in that space, about 12, 13 years or so. Uh, and wow. made a transition to media and entertainment for about four years at uh, formerly Warner Media, now Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, okay. specifically leading cross-platform branded content campaign strategy and program implementation on CNN, um, including wow. editorial sponsorships and experiential events. Um, and now at Amazon working in tech on a consumer tech brand. So I feel like I've had the really wonderful opportunity of having sort of three distinctly different careers, which has been really great. Yeah. And we're going to get back into that later because I know there's a lot of a lot of tips and tricks there that we can learn from. Um, and then just a little summary about your time at AU. Was there anything that you felt you took at SOC um, specifically that prepared you for where you're at or things that you learned that, you know, favorite memory on a project or favorite professor, really just any any fun tidbits you can give us there? Yeah, absolutely. I think I should start by saying that uh, having a public comm uh, bachelor's degree was actually not my intent when I came into AU. I had a plan to go into the legal field, be a lawyer, hence the poli sci double major. Um, and as I was starting to take more classes and really begin to identify who I was and what I really enjoyed, I made that kind of pivot and decided to go with a public comm um, major alongside poli sci. And what I was finding was that I really enjoyed it so much more because marketing as a whole, whether you're doing PR, whether you're doing experiential events, whether you're a generalist, um, is much more creatively minded in many ways, certainly yep. than, than the legal field and, and some others. And I just found myself really gravitating toward that. So something for any prospective or current students, um, particularly in their first or second years to keep in mind, it's okay to change your mind. You don't need to know, even if you've declared a major coming in, um, what you want to do and what you want to focus on. You can totally change that um, along the way. And that's fine. Um, this is your opportunity to really explore and figure out and define who you are. And that's going to change throughout your life. So um, <clears throat> That was something for me that um, was an interesting learning while I was there. I thought I had a very clear path and then whoop, it changed um, and it required more flexibility from me than I really thought I had going in. Um, and some of the classes that I enjoyed the most, even though I didn't end up um, going down that path specifically within marketing, were the PR classes specifically. And um, BJ Altschul, who uh, was a professor at the time, um, is probably the one that comes to mind most. She was so passionate about marketing in general and was very hands-on in the way that she taught and um, made it a point to have us as students go out into the world and find um, small Wonderful. companies, organizations, nonprofits that needed help and to volunteer to execute press releases and create marketing materials. And that real world experience is what 
really got my juices flowing and showed me everything that was possible within the marketing sphere. And um, I, I so remember her classes so clearly because of that. And um, it was a really great experience because it wasn't just learning from a book or learning from someone else's experience. We were really encouraged to go out and, and do it for ourselves and do a trial and error sort of test. It was, it was um, really invaluable to do that. That's wonderful. And I love that you say that because I feel like a lot of the times we focus on what do we want to do? What do we want to do that maybe it's okay to just eliminate the things that we don't want to do. And through that is it takes a lot of exploration, a lot of trial and error. And sometimes checking those off the list will get you closer to figuring out maybe this is what I want to do or or something. So I always encourage people I can totally relate. I was like a math major coming in and then I was a psychology major. It's a lot of different majors. I ended up with a psychology minor though. And while at first I was like, what am I going to do with this? A lot of the times it does come up in interviews because it's like, yes, I know people, I know how they work, I know communication. So it's so cool to find ways to tie it all in together. You know, I think that's up to you and that's, that's up to you how you want to tie it in together. You know, there's no like rhyme or reason. It's just, it's whatever works for you, you know? So and and your path in school and in life is not going to be linear. Right. Uh, that was something that I struggled with at the very beginning. I mentioned I had a plan coming in and as that plan started to change, I did freak out a little bit and begin to question myself and wonder if I was making the right decision or not. And that can be really hard, um, especially if you're a type A person, if you have all of your lists ready to go and you're the one who's finishing things early and and that can be really, really challenging. But, you know, the the best advice I can give is to take a step back and really evaluate what it is that you want, you know, and again, be flexible, know that that could change, but what do you want right now? And what are your goals right now? And then if that requires a shift change, do it and see if it works or not. Don't be afraid to test and learn in your own career, in your own life. Um, that has been the hardest thing for me, but the most valuable thing for me to do throughout my career. And it allowed me to, like I said, have those three different paths. And uh, each one has had its own place yes. in my career growth. And I don't feel like I missed out on anything or made any wrong moves really along the way because it was all a learning experience. Right. That's great. And I feel like this is a good segue into kind of that guidance. I know we talked about this a little bit offline, but can you just dive a little bit deeper into, you know, finding guidance no matter what your field? And maybe I know a lot of people get overwhelmed with like, what organization can I join? And do I have to go to all these events? Because we do have some introverts and that's totally okay. You know, so maybe just giving, although you I actually, because you've had those three paths, um, how did you find those little ways to network and just find guidance and, and really just, you know, build off of the people around you? Yeah, absolutely. And you just said it, it's building off of the people around you. That's exactly it. Not everyone is going to have the capacity or the ability to function as a mentor for you throughout your career, or even while you're still in school. Um, But there will be people who have the time and who want to act as that for you. And so figure out who those people are that you are really going to gain the most knowledge from and get the most out of. Um, It can be difficult to identify those people sometimes, but... Uh, And it is legwork. I will tell you that it is. It's genuine work to do that. Um, But once you find them, you will find that they will be with you along the whole way. Um, That has been the case actually for um, the person who hired me at my very first internship, my second semester at AU. Um, We are still in touch to this day. We're friends on Facebook. Um, I've bounced ideas off of him throughout my career. Um, And so those people can be found. Um, But it's also up to you once you identify those people. And once you begin to build those relationships to continue to maintain them. And that doesn't mean that you need to be in touch with these people constantly. That's not what I'm saying, but reach out to them every six months or so. Let them know how you're doing. Ask about how they're doing. You never know where someone else's career might take them, where it might be of help or use to you, uh, either from an advice standpoint or from getting a job. Um, and it's important to, to keep those connections warm. Um, and for those introverts out there, you don't need to reach out to everyone. Be judicious 
about who you are selecting to reach out to. Be judicious about the groups that you're joining and make sure they're the ones that you really feel match that path that you want to follow. It's not about having to have your fingers in everything. And I, I know how scary and how ultimately time consuming that can be. And you can actually lose your way by doing that. So you really want to be careful and, and craft that communication and that um, path for yourself and develop and define those relationships that will be most beneficial to you. Yes, that's such a good point too. It's almost kind of like job hunting. I mean, you're not going to force yourself to apply to every single job. So, you know, find those qualities that maybe match yours or things that you align with, values that you align with. And I guarantee that organically a relationship will probably, you know, begin anyway, because I feel like that's just as human nature, we kind of gravitate to the things that we're familiar with. So that's a really, really good point. Exactly. And on, on the topic of internships, actually, I know you mentioned that. Can you just give us an idea of some of the internships you did around DC? I always like for our students to kind of get ideas of what they can be looking for, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my first internship um, was with the, it was formerly known as the National Association of Addictions Professionals. It was Political Action Committee. Um, and I went down that path still when I was thinking I was going to really primarily major in poli sci and go down a legal path. Um, and I found uh, that internship actually through the Student Alumni Association at AU that I had joined uh, first semester and then became president of second semester. Wow, um, awesome. If you have those organizations within the community now, I highly um, encourage any students to join them. Uh, meeting alumni while you're still in school is incredibly invaluable. Um, Jonathan Weston was uh, my mentor um, and my boss at that internship, and he had participated uh, in one of our student alumni dinners, and he and I just connected, and he had an opportunity for an intern to come in, and I interviewed and, and got the role, and it was a really great learning ground for me, but also an opportunity to learn that maybe that's what I didn't want to do. Yeah. As I mentioned before, it was, it was great. Um, and I learned a lot, but it turned out to be a different path than I thought I wanted. Um, and then my second internship that I had was actually at the Embassy of Romania. Um, I'm Romanian. And uh, they were looking for someone to come in uh, from the marketing sphere, actually. So that was a nice change up for me. And I got the opportunity to develop a lot of um, educational uh, programs and pamphlets for students in the DC area, uh, particularly younger students in elementary school and high school to learn about uh, Romanian culture, Romanian history. Uh, I worked with the director of communications there on a number of press releases. So a lot of the um, education that I got in those PR classes was put to use at the internship. Um, but I also got to get my hands into a lot of other uh, marketing aspects of that role. And that's really what piqued my interest uh, in that field and what made me want to pursue it professionally. That's great. And I, that's such a good note for um, foreigners living in the U.S., actually, because my advice when I was a college student and a master's student was to reach out to the Embassy of Jordan. And actually, I did a little bit of communications work with them. It was very brief, but it was just, you know, it's sometimes, like I said, it's just good to look to the places you're familiar with. But you'd be surprised at how many internship opportunities they have, even just contracts you can hop on just to help out with whatever, you know, skills you have. And at the same time, it is actually a great, um, speaking of networking, it's good networking because sometimes yeah. you get to go to these events because of where you're from you know like I go to a lot of like Jordan related events and end up meeting so many people that I would never normally just run into a, on a day-to-day -day basis so that is actually another great point yeah there. no absolutely the, the there are so many embassies nonprofits, political action committees in DC I mean you really have the whole world at your fingertips and yes. it's not uh you don't have to be focused in the political realm or the legal realm to gain knowledge and experience in your specific field so look to those places as well because you'd be surprised what you could find there and the connections that you can make there and right. a lot of the embassies too i mean the folks who work there are um uh, dual language. They speak English. They speak, you know, whatever other uh, language of their home country. But if you were uh, raised here, you're a little more uh, familiar with the colloquial nature of things. So when they're looking to yeah. put those pamphlets and materials together, you'll be surprised how much they might lean on you as more of exactly. a quote unquote native of the United States to make sure that things are making sense. And that was a lot of what I did there as well. 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I just wanted to let you know, I, have you heard of our SOC3 program? I have not. Oh my gosh, I feel like you would love this. So uh, basically going off of what you just said about the programs at AU and like the things that you were involved in. So um, Professor Pallavi Kumar, who is heavy on our, you know, public relations and all of that, um, she created this in-class agency. And, and we don't even call it a PR agency because there's so many different positions, but our students actually get to number one, hold a position, meaning like they could be um, creative director or they could be something PR related or, you know, write copyright. I mean, it could be literally anything. Um, and Pullaby's created this agency where students get to take it as a class, but also get to get paid and then work with DC clients. So they are literally taking, you know, real clients out in the field, creating and curating, you know, marketing plans for them and just, you know, campaigns or whatever they're asking for that semester. And it actually just launched last year, last um, semester is the first time. And it's been so successful because of that value that you mentioned of, of feeling like it's not just in the classroom. It's not just, well, this is potentially what could happen. It's really our students out there giving presentations to clients and, and understanding what, you know, uh, market research means and, and how do you gather that? I mean, it's so valuable. And I, I just wanted to let you know that that, that is something that we've actually created. And I'm sure it's based off of things like you, that you said, you know, it's, it's that, that drive to want to get our students out there. So I just want to let you know that that's, that's something that we um, launched last year and it, it's been really, really cool. That's phenomenal. I, I hope it continues year over year and I hope the students are seeing a lot of value in it. I would encourage those who are interested to absolutely join. Um, you would be surprised at sometimes the difference in feedback that you will get from folks in the real world, in your professional field that you have chosen versus the feedback that you get in class. Uh, There's so many nuances in any professional field that you will choose. And um, you're dealing with a lot of different characters in the professional field as well, particularly yes. in marketing across strategy, account management, creative, production. There's a lot to learn and a lot to do and um, a lot of personalities and a lot of different uh, points of view. And yes. you don't always get the benefit of experiencing all of that in a classroom. So. Right. Um, participating in a program like that would be so invaluable where you really get to feel like you were part of an agency and a marketing group and get that feedback from folks who have been in the field, who live it, breathe it day in, day out. You will learn so much from that. Offline, I know you told me a funny story about your email address. Can you share that story again yeah. with our audience? Yes, absolutely. So uh, this kind of goes part and parcel with some advice just about resume building for yes, and we'll uh, get into that current, next. Yep. Yes, current students and uh, recent alumni. So um, I'll dive into some of those details, um, <clears throat> but. I, for my first internship, and I, I did work with a counselor at AU to pull my resume together based on experience that I had gained in high school, classes mm -hmm. that I was taking, um, activities that were relevant um, to secure that first internship. And um, I got it, I mentioned, at the National Association of Addictions Professionals. Mm -hmm. I was super excited going into my first day um, and ready and raring to go. And my boss calls me into his office and I have my notepad. Had. Um, this was pre bringing your laptop everywhere with me. <laughs> I had my notepad and my pen. Yes. I'm ready to be given my first assignment. And yes. um, before he says anything else, he goes, Irina, I have one very important thing for you to do before I give you your first project at this job, at this internship. And I go, okay, great. What is it? And he goes, please, please go to your desk right now and change your email address. And in that moment, I swear my face like melted because <laughs> the email address that I had put on my resume as an 18 year old, brand new yep. college student, sending it up for internships yeah. was punky dancer at yahoo.com. <laughs> I love that. I know. And Mine somehow, was purely few. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 No one had thought to tell me to change it to something more professional. I yeah. highly doubt that that is an issue in this day and age. I feel you know, like you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd be surprised. Actually, there's there's a few creative emails still out there. I, I'm sure there are, but I hope that uh, but yes. No, it's even... it's a good point. It's like it's like how do you how do you brand yourself? And that comes down to every single detail. You know, it's it's in all seriousness, it really is an important um, thing. Also, because you know, your email tends to be one of the first 
things you see on your resume when you go top to bottom. So it's like those few first few details are very, very important. So yes. I do definitely agree with that. Absolutely. But that's that's a great story to segue into kind of the world of resume building. And I know you said um, you were a hiring manager at one point. Are you still doing that? Or is that something that you did in the past? Yeah, no. So I uh, was very fortunate in my career. I uh, became a hiring manager and oversaw my first team when I was just 25. Wow, um, and awesome. I've kind of been on that trajectory ever since just has been really great, but I was sort of thrown into it very young, right? I was still very early in my own career and having to manage others, build plans for them for how to learn and grow in their roles and their careers, make sure that they were on path and that they felt comfortable with everything that they were working on and had the yeah. opportunity to touch different things. Um, and it has been really great, uh, being in that position and in that role. And, you know, you say hiring manager, but I really do see it as being a mentor for others in their careers. And I take that to heart. Um, and over the years, those that, um, reported into me on my team still come back. It just happened a couple of weeks ago, uh, to ask me to look at their resumes. Again, oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. To ask me to reach out to someone that I know for a job that they're interested in. Um, so that kind of goes back to what you're we talking about, maintaining those relationships and keeping those connections warm, right? Um, but specifically related to, to resume building and job hunting, the biggest piece of advice that I could give to anyone is <clears throat> pay particular attention to your resume. And if you are also building a portfolio, Mm -hmm. your portfolio. Okay. Those are the documents and the elements that follow you around for your entire career. They need to be perfect and they need to tell a story. Um, if your resume, for example, as a hiring manager or someone who's reviewing them and deciding who I'm going to bring in for interviews ultimately to hire for a position on my team, um, if I see that there are major formatting errors on your resume, lots of spelling errors, I don't really care what you've done in your career or in your internships or at school. That to me shows a severe lack of attention to detail and lack of care in presenting yourself, in telling your story um, and defining who you are. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't look good. Yeah. Um, and you might have the best experience out there, but I'm gonna put your resume in the bottom of the pile. Yeah before I, you know, come back those to it. If, if I yep. do, those those little details really, really, really matter. Um, and so make sure that you have that attention to detail. The formatting is perfect. There are no spelling errors. That your uh, sentence structure is accurate. That right. you're putting yeah. things in the past tense or present and, tense properly yep. if they need to be. Um, and tell a really clear, concise story with results to back up your achievements. That is really important. Data is becoming more and more important. Um, and it doesn't matter what your field is, what your specialty is, you can support your achievements with data points. And you need to be doing that because the worst thing that you can do on top of having spelling errors or formatting issues in your resume is to have your res resume read like a job description. Mm -hmm. No one wants to read that. It doesn't tell me who you are. It doesn't tell me what you've done. It doesn't tell me what you've achieved in your role. It just tells me kind of what your day-to-day -day is. And you want to avoid that at all yeah. costs. Really think about That's the projects that. that you've worked on. Really think about what your... Um, <clears throat> goals against that project were, what you specifically have achieved um, against those projects, and keep those notes as you kind of are in the midst of building those projects and once you're done with them so that when it comes time to update your resume, it's not a mad dash scramble to do it because you found another job in that moment that you have to apply to right now because you don't want to miss the window or um, yeah. because you've reached a point of frustration at your current job and you just feel like you really have to leave now. Your, your resume is a document that is going to frustrate you. Yes. Every time I've had to update my resume, it has been a days, if not weeks long process Same. to yep. update it, to finesse it, to tweak it. Um, I hate doing it. And I have changed jobs quite a lot in my career, particularly when I was on the advertising agency side of the business, I was sort of shifting agencies every two to three years to gain new industry experience and learn and grow in my career. It was sort of just the nature of, of the business. 
Um, but I learned very fast that I could not just wait to update my resume when the time came to leave. Right. It's, it's right. really an iterative process and you're going to want to throw your computer out the window. Yes. On 100%. 100%. <laughs> 100%. It's like, yeah, when you, you, uh, convert it to PDF and then all of a sudden things aren't the way they were when they were. In yes, I know. It's, it's so it's frustrating, but I will say that it's very important. I've actually tried to get into the habit of just kind of updating it whenever something happens. Cause I feel like maybe that's like a little, at least for me personally, it's a little easier to keep track of everything. Cause there will come a point like a year, two years in where I'm like, Oh my God, I've done so much and I have not updated my resume. And that's yeah. when it's an overwhelming moment. I'm like, yes. okay. And it's so easy to forget those things. Yeah. And as you start writing it out, you go, Oh my gosh, well, I also worked on this other project and and guess what now you're forgetting the details you have exactly. no way of getting the metrics exactly. to prove success yeah. yes um and and it just becomes really hard and then you you feel like you can't add it to your resume as a as a talking point because you don't fully remember what you can say about it don't don't fall into that trap keep notes um be at the ready with that information you never know when it's going to come up and not just for your resume either when you are making those new connections in the professional world um whether you're attending an alumni event or some other networking event and someone asks you about what you do or what you're really proud of it's going to help you be at the ready in those moments to explain those scenarios and to do so um knowledgeably <laughs> And that's really, really important. Um, another thing, too, to keep in mind, it's not just your resume. Bios have become much more important, particularly with LinkedIn and everyone using that as a, as a major platform for job searching and for sourcing candidates. Um, really think about how you want to position yourself professionally, of course, but also who are you? What are you passionate about? What are your goals? Really take the time to properly reflect on that because having that down pat will better prepare you if you end up, particularly with an interviewer who asks you the dreaded open-ended question, tell me about yourself. Yes. I hate that question. I personally never ask it in interviews because it's really- It's a tough one. <laughs> it's a tough one to answer and it's not impossible to answer, but you need to have those- bullets ready and it needs to be a mix of who you are professionally and who you are yes. personally and give them a tidbit that will remind them yes. of who you are mm -hmm. um and so really think about your bio as well yeah. it's it's not just about your resume and your portfolio your bio says a lot about you and when folks are scanning that's going to be the one thing that they might actually read fully those few sentences and then they're like going to skim through everything else yeah. I think there's like this misconception that elevator pitches are only for the film industry, but what your bio is almost your personal elevator pitch. I mean, how can you summarize yourself in like yes. one to two minutes? Because that's all the time you're really going to have. So it's the same thing. It's like, you know, you're going to pitch a movie project. Well, what are the most important aspects of this movie project that I need to let them know in the 30, probably 30 seconds you have. So it's, yeah, I completely agree with that. And then another, um, follow-up to that I actually really liked is when you said it needs to tell a story because yes. I think we're so and to be quite honest there's a lot of jobs like the one you're in maybe the one I'm in which changes here and there of course because I'm doing like a lot of production stuff however a lot of the office type work um, at the end of the year you will have to bring up these goals anyway you know you'll have to bring all of these up so it is such a good habit whether it's resume building whether it's just keeping track of tr keeping track of the work you're doing it's so important to be taking notes and metrics like what happened exactly so I took out this camera and I, I went out into the field but what did you shoot with that camera I mean what what, what was the outcome because any anyone can grab a camera and walk out the door. Right. So it's like, there's certain things. Um, I've learned a lot of that through this podcast, you know, the, the downloads, the traffic, the people were reaching and you know, that, that makes the bullet point so much more valuable because it does. It what does. can I do with this podcast? Correct. Here are, I can show you here they are, you know, here are the measurements, here's this. Um, but that's such a good point because I think a lot of the time we get into the habit of it reading like a job description, even though we don't mean to, it's just, it's like, okay, well I did this. Right. But how was that successful? Because I, I, as a hiring manager, exactly. I'm sure that's what you're looking for. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's and awesome. in, in that point. storytelling, it's important to show growth right? It's yes, take the bullet points that you've started to build out that sound like a job description. Yes. And look at them from a storytelling perspective. And this is for any career path. This is for yes. any role. 
Um, it doesn't matter. You do not need to be in a creative field. If you've had the opportunity in the role that you've been in for two, three, four, however many years, right. how do you show that growth trajectory from where you started to where you are today? And that doesn't mean that you have to show every single example. And maybe you can leave some of that earlier stuff off if it's irrelevant for the role that you um, are interviewing for or applying for now. You don't have to put everything in there. Um, but what is that story that you want to tell? How do you want to position yourself in terms of growth and success? Um, that's really, really, really the most important thing. And the candidates whose resumes I've reviewed over the years who are able to tell that story very clearly and very concisely are the first ones I'm going to call in for an interview. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. That's awesome. And I hope anybody listening, whether you're a prospective student, whether you're a current student about to graduate, those are all really, really good notes <laughs> to follow. And then I know I have one more question and this wasn't something we discussed side note, um, but it really, it just, struck a chord with me because at 25 years old, you said you're managing a team. Can you give some advice for anybody who maybe finds themselves in a leadership type role? What are the certain qualities that you think are super important? Because I know leadership can happen at any age. So it doesn't, you know, that doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it really is. It really is. Um, it, there's so much that goes into it. I'm sure personal qualities and, you know, so anything you can kind of shed light on there. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the most important facets of being a leader, being a mentor, managing a team um, is listening. First and foremost, yes, you are there to be a leader in the sense of teaching as well and helping your team to grow, but you need to listen to them as well. Um, and I have a great example here. Um, early on in my career, I was working with someone who was on my team and she was having a tough time in an account management role. It was more stressful for her than I think she had envisioned. Dealing with clients on a regular basis was, was a challenge. Um, but she really, really, really loved and had a very deep passion for advertising. Um, I ended up having to put her on a performance improvement plan. Um, I think I was 26 at the time, so still very new. Right. Um, and it was really difficult to do because I was still learning in my own right. career and growing as a, as a manager and a mentor, but mm -hmm. um, her performance levels just weren't where they needed to be despite my attempts to help, despite another person's attempts to help. And what it really came down to was the fact that she had this love and this passion for advertising, but she was in the wrong role. And again, that's okay. It's okay to fail if you learn from that experience. And she made a change in her career. She stayed in advertising still for some time uh, after that, but she changed to a strategic role. And she is doing so phenomenally well because that just suited her personality and her way of working and the things that she actually wanted to focus on. Amazing. Yeah. much more than being in an account management role. So yeah. know that even if you are in a position like that, where maybe you um, are underperforming, especially if you're one of those people who's not used to being in a position like that, yeah. she certainly wasn't, you know, very much type A, very much wanted to do everything mm -hmm. right and get everything done on time. And that's right. all well and good. Um, but it's, it's okay to learn through those processes and to yes. have those failures in your career. And I think the important thing is to... Be open and honest with your boss and your mentor about how right. you're feeling yeah. about the role and the position that you're in and what you want to do, what you feel you're getting out of it, what you feel you're not getting out of it, that you want yes. more of. And that was something for me that was really important very early on to be that listener because I yeah. wanted to make sure that I was setting up my team for success because I'm only going to be as successful as they are. And if they're not right. feeling comfortable and confident in their roles, and if they're not feeling like they're getting where they want to go and learning the things that they want to learn, that's a huge problem and a big misstep on my part, not on theirs. Um, and I know it can be really harrowing to raise your hand and have that conversation, but it is so important to do. Don't get to a point where you are so frustrated that you just want to leave, especially if your boss is genuinely trying to help. Uh, I, you'll see that, you know, you, you will be able to tell that. And um, if that's the case, 
take that moment, take that breath, have that meeting, have that conversation and know that that person will be there to help you. No one wants you to fail. Trust me. No one wants to put anyone on a performance improvement plan. No one wants to have someone on their team who's unhappy. Um, It it doesn't work to anyone's benefit. So um, be honest with yourself, Mm -hmm. be honest with your boss. Um, And if you find that that person isn't the type that's going to listen, then maybe you need to at that point look for something else either with yes outside sure very true Mm -hmm. but but in large part people do want to help you they do want to make sure that you find your way so don't don't be scared yeah do that yes I always say transparency is so huge in work in personal life in everything because it's as long as that open communication is there I think you could talk about anything and everything you know and and like I feel that in my current role actually I'm very lucky very blessed shout out to you uh she listens to this podcast (laughs) my supervisor she's great I mean there's nothing we feel we can't talk to her about so that's allowed for a lot more flexibility in my role of just being like you know what this is burning me out or this is actually something I'd like to try more of or you know I think yeah having someone that's willing to listen to that first and foremost so that we can work together to come to, you know, a better conclusion is really, really important. But yes, on the, on the other hand, you probably will be able to tell if someone's not willing to help you out or not willing to listen. And I will say that a bad, a bad, you know, leadership individual actually can make or break a job. So I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> and I've certainly been there in my career yes. as well. And I will tell Thanks, you yeah. what, I feel like I, and I'm sure this is true for a lot of people, learned more from the superiors and peers that I had who I didn't get along with the best or who gave me the hardest time because I learned about the things that I didn't want to be myself and the things that I wanted to stay away from doing. And that was incredibly invaluable as a people manager as well because you don't want to be the person that is the reason that someone leaves a job. Right. right. I, I don't ever want to be that person. I, as far as I know, have never been that person. Um, and that's not the case for everyone, but you can learn so much from the folks who yeah. are those people. They are out there, unfortunately. Yeah. Few mm-hmm. and far between, um, but take yeah. note. Take note yeah. of those things. As well. say, take take note, note of the negative and, yes. and make it a point to not be that. Because it's it's funny, actually, being the person on the outside sometimes when you're not in that leadership role, but you're able to observe, you can actually see the cause and effect that it has because you're more privy to your coworkers, you know, feelings and emotions and all that versus like in a leadership role, sometimes you're not unless you're approached by, you know, so it's actually funny because I think that's that is the most important time to take note because there's a lot of notes that you're going to take, you know, because you really do get to see how it affects the workplace, the work environment, every the people's morale. So yeah, that's super important. Super important. Um, and then I just want to ask you real quick, how is LA? I know you went to the LA intensive this year. Yes, yes I did. Um, no, LA is great. I bounced around back and forth between uh, New York and LA a few times since graduating from AU. So uh, very much been bi-coastal, which has been great. Yeah. Do you uh, have a coastal preference or... Um, I don't really. I love okay. LA and New York for, yeah. for different reasons, and they're a wildly yeah. different city. They are wildly different. Um, you know, I think in an ideal world, I would love to be in both places at once, but we know that's not possible. Um, but yeah, no, the LA intensive uh, for the um, Entertainment and Media Alumni Alliance was great. Um, and shame on me, it was the first alumni event that I participated in since graduating all the way back in 2006. Um, and it was really wonderful to see not just the turnout from alumni, because there were quite a few that were there uh, to support the students that were there for the LA intensive, but also just the um, desire to be involved and to be present um, and from the students and their awareness of the importance of participating in programs like that and creating those connections with 
alumni. It was really great to see the students that I was speaking with say, I'm going to connect with you on LinkedIn right now. And they would do it while we were standing there. So, you know, no one's giving out business cards anymore these days. Uh, right. Yeah. Is kind of where it's all happening. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it was wonderful to see that. And it was uh, not just them sending me a connection request, but just a very quick note as well. Like, hey, it was so great to chat with you about X topic so that I could then recall later what exactly it was that we talked about so that if and when we connect again, I know where to uh, reinvigorate that conversation from. Um, and so that that was really great. Unlike the you know lack of awareness I had with my email address when I was in school. Um, but that that is really, really great to see. And I highly encourage any students that are participating at those events, don't let that moment pass you by. Make sure you're paying attention to people's name tags. If you can't see them, you know, ask them to to flip it over or whatever it is, move their hair out of the way. If that's the case, ask them their name again. If you missed it the first time, that shouldn't be a point of embarrassment for anyone. Um, when you're in a big group event like that, it's very easy for someone to tell you their name and for you to forget two seconds later. But as you have those conversations and you realize like, oh my goodness, this is someone that I really want to keep in touch with. This is someone yes. that um, could be of value to me in my mm -hmm. career as I learn and grow. Ask them again. Connect with them on LinkedIn right then and there. They're not going to say no, especially yes. if they're at that event. They are right. there to support you right. as an alumni. <laughs> right. So, and that's the thing. Them showing up is already them kind of letting you know, like, we're correct. here for you. We're here to help you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So make sure that you that you do that. Take advantage of that. But the reception was really wonderful. Um, I'm looking forward now. I mentioned it was the first event that I um, participated in, and shame on me for that. Um, but I'm looking forward to getting more involved in helping to plan events like that for alumni in the Los That's Angeles awesome. area and really galvanize those of us who, who are here mm -hmm. through a variety of events and just being more present and participatory um, in events That's like great. that. So yeah, it, it was That's really awesome. wonderful to see. And I'm, I'm glad that um, more seems to be happening now. Obviously, yeah. things took a bit of a dive with the pandemic the last couple of years, but it's really nice to see yeah. everything getting re-energized. Yes. Um, and people are really, they, they want that. They yeah. want that. They want mm -hmm. that connection. Um, and so I think it's really important and I, I want to do more. I want to see more. That's awesome. We hope to see you at more events. Um, but to, to your note with the students, I feel like we every year we send out a cohort. We're like, this is the most amazing cohort. This is the most amazing cohort. But I feel like it's really with this new generation of students who are so like digitally involved, like we've got TikTok and social media that they actually really do know how to connect and quickly yes. just this is going to be an immediate interaction and I'm going to get that connection right away. And it's like they know how to brand themselves automatically because yeah. of how, you know, out there they are with all of this like changing technology. Yeah. I actually feel like I'm, you know, for example, my student workers that I work with, my production assistant, my podcast assistant, I learned so much from them because there is clearly a gap there, right? Like yeah. there's clearly a gap. <laughs> I am not going to deny it. In fact, I love to learn from it. So yeah, that's so cool. I love to hear that. I'm so proud of them. It was Thank a great you. cohort that, um, that went out this year. In terms of mentorship, yes. um, even if you are not participating in certain clubs or organizations on campus, maybe you are that introvert who isn't keen on those things for one thing or another, again, that's fine. Um, but there are still going to be people even within the AU environment, professors, for example, and other leaders at the school who are going to resonate with you and who, again, I say, want to help you. So if there is someone that you have found um, via an event or a professor whose classes you're taking who yeah. um, you really enjoy learning from them, go to their office hours or ask them after classes if they would be willing to just spend some extra time with you chatting through your career goals, um, the things that you want to learn in class, other experiences that you want to have, what recommendations they have for maybe literature outside of the class that you should be reading um, just to better prepare yourself. Um, again, those folks want to help you. It's going to be rare that someone is going to say no. And honestly, the worst thing they can do is say no. Or if you're sending someone a cold message on LinkedIn one day uh, because they're in a field that you're interested in or they work at a company that you're interested in. And what's the, aside from saying no, the worst thing they could do is just completely ignore your request. It's just not replied. Yeah. No harm done. Yeah. No yeah. harm done. Move on to the next um, and find that person who is not just willing, but also able 
yes. to give you their time. There are also yes. a lot of folks who want to and are eager to to mm-hmm. be that that mentor and play that role in people's yeah. lives, but time time is limited. Yes. Um, but you can and you will find those people. But leverage the resources on campus yeah. as well. It's not just about finding already folks there. Who are, yeah, they're already there. And those professors and those leaders at the school also have connections outside yes. the school. <laughs> so yep. don't forget that either. They can absolutely help point you in the right direction, yeah. put you in contact with a connection of theirs. So don't leave them off the table either. Um, I, one of the professors uh, who led the leadership program at AU while I was there, she was the very first professor um, along with BJ Alchul at SOC um, who wrote a letter of recommendation for me. That's great, uh, yeah. From an internship and that I took to my first job interviews um, and also on LinkedIn. I have my very first recommendation on LinkedIn <laughs> was awesome. actually from Sarah yeah. Stiles, a former professor at AU. And I'm really proud of that because she was able to see me in that environment, knowing that I was ready to jump into the professional world and to be able to speak to that from a professorial point of view. And so that's really important too. Mm -hmm. I was a very introverted student, so I had a lot of trouble with that. But funny enough, life has really come full circle because here here I am hosting a podcast. (laughs) But I also try to your notes. Funny that you say that I try to bring on as many professors and like faculty as I can, because I'm like, the more these students can just see them being like just like us, like just like, yeah, you know, having people. these conversations yeah. and they're really open to talking about things that maybe aren't related to class and your degree. And like, they're really cool people. So I've loved that because number one, a lot of them are my old professors. So kind of having that like full circle moment of like, here we are, you know? Um, but also I, I really hope the students are getting to see another side of them because that's kind of what I had in mind when I started this is I want them to be able to approach their professors, but I really have had a lot of students tell me, well, I'm, I'm, scared. I don't know what to say. What if they don't know me? What if they don't know who I am? A lot of classes are big and I totally get that too. Like I know back in our day, there was a lot of classes I took that were like in, you know, our old like ward halls that were like 150 people. And I don't see that a lot nowadays, but I know they're still there. So, you know, it's so, yeah, it's so valuable, but it's like you said, it's, it's resources that are literally in your backyard, as we say, they're right there. And you're only holding yourself back if you talk yourself out of doing something before you do it. 100%. 100%. So don't assume that you're just a number in a class or that maybe if you're not getting an A, it's not the right professor to go to. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. Um, if if that professor uh, is, is teaching you things that are going to be invaluable for you while you're in school and potentially in your career and that's the person who, who cares if you if you're getting a B in their class or you got a yeah. C on an exam or whatever yeah. it is, go ask them. It's a missed opportunity if you don't. You do not need to be the straight A student to go right. up to your professor and ask for advice, help, yeah. mentorship, whatever mm-hmm. it is, completely unrelated to the coursework. Yes. Yes. I actually have personal experiences of classes that I haven't really done very well in, but I still have relationships with those professors. I just, it wasn't like writing was not my strong suit and that's okay. And I knew that and I was okay with that. And they were okay with that as long as I tried my best. But sometimes I found that, you know, the energy I'd give them is the energy they'd give me back. So sometimes when they see that you're really interested in getting to know them and stuff, they'll be really interested in getting to know you too. And sometimes it stays very surface level, surface level if you let it. And so, like you said, it's kind of like, the only person stopping you is you. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to be perfect at everything. Yeah. That's not that's not a reality of life. It's just not. And uh, if you don't realize that while you're in school, you will be slapped in the face with it yes. when you enter the professional mm-hmm. world. Yep. So yep. rest assured, you will come to that realization soon enough. Um, it's it's not about perfection. It never is. It's about continuing to want to learn, continuing mm-hmm. to want to grow. And yes, realizing where you might fall short, particularly if where you're falling short is imperative and important to your career. But with that in mind, then what can you do to get better at that? 
Who can right. you talk to to learn from? What 100%. additional classes might you want to take? Certification programs, books to read, um, mm-hmm. things like that. Don't don't look at those things that you're not perfect at as reasons to see yourself as a failure. Right. Reasons to tell yourself no or to not do something or to not pursue something. Um, and use it as an opportunity. Everything is an opportunity. I know we all say that, but it really is, but it really is. Yeah. true. It's mm-hmm. really, really true. Those who get stuck on, on that idea of perfection, which I did for a very long time, I still do at times. It is a constant struggle. It will never go away if you're that person. I will tell you that right now, but be aware of it and, and do everything that you can to, to break yourself out of those bad habits because right. you will only be helping yourself by doing mm-hmm. that. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. It can be really hard and you're going to hit those really low moments and that sucks. Um, But you will be able to pull yourself out of it and find that path forward and kind of see that light at the end of the tunnel. Right. But it's, it's, it's work and it can be tough. Um, But that's also a fact of, of life in general careers are not meant to be easy. Life isn't meant to be easy. Uh, You take, you get out of it what you give. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. And they say, they say the best things take time too. Like that's your career. You know, it's like, it, it takes time sometimes and that's okay too. That's yeah, something I really had to come yeah, to. Yeah. And testing and learning. And yeah. I, like I said, I've had three different career paths all within marketing. Um, but, and I was very strategic in the choices that I made and when I made them um, to do that. But um, you don't have to stick with the one thing that you chose right out of college. That's not the point of this, yes. this life. If you right. go into something and you realize it's not for you for one reason or another, that's okay. Stick it out for long enough to know with certainty that that's something that you don't want to continue pursuing. Don't just jump from one to the next immediately because you won't have the foundational knowledge or skill set to know for sure. And you don't want to be in a position where you're looking back and wondering if you made a mistake and made a switch too soon. So make sure that you're giving yourself that time and that breadth to really um, decide Right. for yourself if it is or is not the right thing before you make that jump. But it's okay to do that. It's okay to make that change. You should not be scared of those things. No one is going to um, ding you for job hopping these days. It happens a lot. I did it in my career. Correct. Yeah. It's it's not a it's not a detrimental factor to to getting a job. But you do again going back to the the resume uh, building points want to prove that you have learned something right during the time that you have been wherever you're at right now Mm -hmm. in terms of resume pages so I know when you don't have that much experience they say it's best to keep it to one page because make it as easy as possible for the hiring manager manager to read now and this actually is a little bit of a personal question for me too when you then start building so much experience and arguably some of them are as valuable as the others so it's hard to like you know be like, I'm not going to include this, but I want to include this. Um, what's your advice there? Like once your real experience really starts to build and you really can't get it on one page, do you have any advice for that? I do because I struggled with that myself, um, particularly job hopping quite a bit when I was on the advertising agency side of the business. Um, you want to pack everything in and you want to show where you've worked and all the clients that you've, uh, worked with and the different industries that you've touched. Um, it goes back to my point of being judicious. Absolutely. Make sure you choose the right projects and the ones where you have very clear cut performance metrics that you can attach to them. Um, that doesn't mean that everything needs to have a metric attached to it. That's not what I'm right. saying. But, you know, make sure that a few of the points for each role that you've had um, do have metrics to prove success. Um, my resume, I will tell you, is two pages. It could be five. What I have done on mine, I, I'm 17 years into my career. My resume right. was not two pages before I hit probably 10 to 12 years. Okay. That's like in where I'm career. about to hit. I'm about to hit a decade. So it's like, I, I'm it so becomes confused beautiful. now. Yeah, so it it's, it's okay. It's okay. okay to go to two pages. And okay. then if you are in a position like myself, where because you have changed jobs quite a bit, because you wanted to learn and grow and do all kinds of different things, um, I limit myself to basically a period of time where maybe what I've done isn't so relevant because it's so far in the past. So it's not going to be... 
uh, crucial for me to include it on my resume, on this piece of paper that someone's going to read for me to get this particular job, but maybe they're curious. So resumes are sent digitally these days. I include a link to LinkedIn at the end of my resume um, before I include the bottom section about education and interests. Um, so once you're kind of done describing the roles that you've had and the specific role, the the specific um, achievements and projects and things that you've worked on in those roles, at the bottom, you can say for work experience from X year to Y year, please reference LinkedIn gotcha. and drive them there. Okay. Um, and so okay, links are so valuable. <laughs> are so Everything valuable. Digital. And that's actually another thing too. So I being a marketer, I don't have a portfolio specifically for what I do. Certainly someone who might be a, um, designer, a creative director of a co- or a copywriter will have a portfolio. Make sure you're linking to that portfolio from your resume. However, even though I don't have a portfolio myself, I have a lot of different um, projects and campaigns that I have worked on throughout my career that I do link to on my resume. So if someone is curious, if I'm talking about a specific campaign around the Olympics, for example, that I worked on for Gillette years ago, I'm linking to that campaign spot on YouTube, or I'm linking to an article that discusses all of the details of that campaign that uh, was profiled in Ad Age or whatever trade um, media platform covered it. That's important too, because it um, visualizes for folks what you've done. So you're not just explaining it in that bullet point, you know, I worked on an Olympics campaign for Gillette. They can actually see it even if you don't have a portfolio. So include those hyperlinks on your resume um, as well. That's something that uh, I have found to be, I no one told me to do that. At one point I figured it was probably something useful to do because you can also include links um, under specific job descriptions on LinkedIn. So I started yes, that's doing that. what I've been doing. Yeah. yeah. So so I started like- doing that there and I thought, you know what? I should probably be doing this on my yeah. resume just in case someone doesn't think to go to my LinkedIn page. Let me put everything here. And so I started hyperlinking to the same um, articles, the same, uh, like I said, YouTube links, if it's a video I want someone to watch of a, of a campaign yeah. that was executed uh, on my resume itself. So you don't have to go multiple places to see those things. So if you have a means to to do that, particularly in a creative field, of course, do it um, because you're you're also adding value to the person who's reading your resume without making them search for those right. things if they are curious to learn more and see what the actual output was. Think, put yourself in the shoes of the prospective hiring manager, of the HR person who's going to be reading your resume. What do you want to see on there? What do you want to have access to as that person who doesn't know you, who is literally going to make a judgment call based on the sentences and paragraphs that you have on a single yes. sheet of paper? Mm-hmm. That's awesome. That's what do you such want that person advice. to get out yeah. of it? Um, yeah. And ask for advice from your peers from your professors, from um, those folks who were your mentors at internships or at jobs to look at your resume for yeah. you. Um, yeah, that, that was going to be my point earlier, <laughs> just to the like spelling errors. and gra- Sometimes we read our own stuff so yes. much that we yes. will inevitably forget something. So my yes. advice is always give it to at least two fresh eyes. At least Not two. one, but two, because you don't know what that one's going through that day. They could also be very just energy down, you know, you just never know. So I would say yes. two, um, even if that's just like, sometimes I just send them to my siblings. I have three other siblings. So I'm like, well, I got three people right there, you know, who are very yeah. much <laughs> involved in their own resumes. So I send it right over, but it's just, it's so good to just whoever you can send it to just yeah. so they can look because their eyes are fresh and they'll yes. find that right away. Yes. They, you, you need that gut check from someone else, especially if you're stuck on how you describe a role and your achievements within that role. And it might make sense to you as you're writing it because you know it inside out, but to someone else who has not lived it as you did, they might read that sentence and go, what? I don't understand what this person is trying to tell me. So that's equally as important. It's not just the spelling errors and the formatting. It's how is someone else reading that? And are they 
actually getting what you are trying to describe? Is that understandable? Is it concise? Is it clear? Um, Because I can tell you, I've seen many resumes where like, I can tell what someone's trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. But the way in which it was written was very jumbled and roundabout um, because you get to your point, get so stuck in your head because you're so familiar yes. with it that it becomes difficult to think about it from the outside. Yeah. So always do that gut check. Siblings are great. Friends, roommates, absolutely. Professors, guidance counselors at, at the schools, absolutely. Uh, internship mentors, yeah. um, coaches. If you're coaches, in, in, yes. wherever, whoever is willing to just take a look for you, I suggest you take advantage of that absolutely. for sure. And take that advice to heart. Um, I have completely chopped up some resumes for. Uh, former colleagues of mine, friends of mine, and I can tell the frustration when I'm talking them through all of the things that I would change or send them something that is redlined top to bottom. Know that the person that's helping you with that isn't doing it to show you everything you've done wrong. Mm -hmm. You've asked them for help and they're offering that help so that it can be the best possible document to represent yourself that it can be. Again, that document is the one thing that follows you around your entire career. It's the most important thing that you will ever spend your time on in your career. It really is. Um, and don't be afraid if someone's just got red marks yes. all over it. They're, I was going to say, we're doing this a service to you. <laughs> that's also just understanding what constructive criticism is and your yeah. relationship with that. And just the more you understand what that is, I guarantee the more it's easier to just get someone's comments and not take it to heart at all because it's like, okay, got it. I'm going to definitely put these into action. Thank you so much. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much. These, This was, uh, for anyone listening, I actually kind of like how this episode all came full circle. <laughs> but we started, we started talking about what you like and what you don't like. And then we ended with, at the end of the day, everything kind of sort of leads to, it's okay to find out what you like and what you don't like. So yeah. <laughs> love that. Um, Irina, thank you so much. There have been yeah. some valuable tips and tricks in here. Um, I'm excited to meet you, hopefully at an, a future alumni event. Yes, I am definitely for planning sure. on going to as many as I Beautiful. am available for in the future. Awesome. So I absolutely hope to awesome. um, see you in person um, after some email communications and now doing I this. I know. And now this great episode. This is one of my favorite episodes. This is awesome. <laughs> thank you so, so yeah, thank much. You for, thank you for having me. Um, this was really great. And I hope that at least absolutely. some of the information that I've provided is of value to oh, the yeah. students at SOC. Um, and if anyone wants to reach out with questions or if you want me to take a look at your resume um beautiful to do it so please don't please don't hesitate uh use me as practice if you want for uh you know cold emailing or cold messaging uh folks i'm i'm happy to help because i wish i had had more of that when Mm -hmm. i was just starting out in my career linkedin was very new and everything was very word of mouth, who you knew, someone who could put you in touch with someone else. Folks weren't really reaching out um, out of the blue as much as they are um, now. And so I, it was a huge learning curve for me, probably more mid-career when I really needed to do that to figure out the how. You know, how how to write an intro to myself to get someone else to engage because it just wasn't an inherent part of my early career. Um, so take advantage of, of those folks who are offering you help now and be at the ready for when you graduate. And with that, we will put Irina's contact info in the description. So you can visit her LinkedIn, um, take a look at what to do on that profile as well. It's a lot of tips and tricks there. Um, But thank you so much. Um, If you'd like to listen to older episodes of the podcast, please visit Spotify. We're a video uh, podcast on Spotify now. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or really wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to donate to the School of Communication, go to giving.american.edu. And that's a wrap.